Welcome everyone to uh, Charcha 2021. Uh, let me uh, start by thanking the sponsors and the organizers and Nudge Foundation in particular. Um, this is the education theme, Rebuild Education Back Better. Uh, and the topic of our panel today is Nipun Bharat Mission, an opportunity to reform the education system. Uh, we have about 50 minutes uh, on this panel. Um, and our panelists, I'll just quickly introduce them. Um, Asia Kazmi, who is the Global Education Policy Lead at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Welcome, Asia. Seema Bansal, who is Partner and Director at the Boston Consulting Group, uh, the Social Impact Practice. Uh, she manages Asia Pacific. Welcome, Seema. And Saurav Banerjee, who is the Country Director at Room to Read India. Uh, I will be the moderator for the session. My name is Amitav Virmani. I am the CEO of the Education Alliance. If I could just uh, turn all of your attention to a quick poll that I would like to conduct uh, amongst those who are attending this panel, just so that we can get a better sense of your uh, understanding of the FLN mission. No names will be revealed, so please do answer accurately. Uh, the question, if I can ask the organizers to put the poll question up, please. So here it is. Um, you need to just click an option. What level of understanding proficiency do you have of Nipun Bharat Mission, the foundation literacy and numeracy mission launched by the government of India? If you can just answer one of the three options below. We'll give you 15 seconds, and then we'll reveal the results. I hope everyone has voted. Could I ask the organizers to reveal the results, please? Can we have the results or are we facing some difficulty? I don't see it on my screen. I'm getting a message on my side chat. Uh, but it said, uh, I've got the results here on my phone, which said 10% have said highly proficient. Uh, what are the other results? 50. 50% have said somewhat proficient, and then the remainder, I assume, 40% uh, not proficient. So I will go with that, that between, um, well, actually 90% uh, are somewhat or not proficient at all. Um, I'm going to actually, so therefore, the panelists, please uh, go with the assumption that not very many people are aware of this mission. And if you can peg your conversations at that level. Can I also request the organizers to play the video to set the context? We've got a two minute video that we'd like to uh, show you all, which hopefully will set the context of where we're at uh, as a country uh, with regard to our learning levels in grades one, two, three, but more importantly, what is the FLN mission? So if I can just uh, request the organizers to quickly play that.
Thank you. Okay, so hopefully that set the context. I'll just recap a little bit of what was said in that film um, before I move to the panelists. Essentially, you saw that 73% of students in grade three can't read a simple text um, or can't add 42 plus 59. And sadly, this has been the story, as you know, through Asar for the last 15 years, if not more. Um, so while the desired average reading speed of the Akshara language uh, basis studies is anywhere to the tune of 25 to 30 correct words per minute, I think some studies that have been done across the country have shown that the average speeds are nearer 10 to 12 to 15 words per minute. So we're not even 50% of the way there. Um, and, and who knows across the country what the situation is. Now, I think this is the reality, uh, basis which I think, thanks to NEP, uh, and the Nippon launch and the Honorable Prime Minister who made a statement after FLN was given a priority in NEP uh, stating the importance of FLN. I, I think he went on to say that achieving universal FLN is uh, probably the highest priority in NEP and any other policy initiative in NEP is, is worthless uh, unless we attain universal uh, FLN. Um, so on the 5th of July, as you know, that um, the Honorable Education Minister launched the Nippon Bharat mission, which is a national mission for foundational literacy and numeracy. Every state is expected to, uh, to plan, design, and deliver that by 2026. It talks about every child by grade three being able to read with comprehension. They talk about 60 words per minute by end of grade three. Uh, it talks about being able to write, uh, being able to do basic mathematical operations. Uh, which means knowing numbers to 999 and doing simple multiplication and learn basic skills. But I also want to share a little bit about the expectations from Nipun Bharat and the complexities involved in delivering a mission of this magnitude. So the objectives really are A, to build an inclusive classroom um, and introduce activity-based pedagogies. B, create motivated, independent, engaged readers and writers. Uh, C, create independent problem-solving skills amongst children. D, develop high-quality and culturally responsive teaching learning materials. E, ensure continuous capacity building of teachers and other education officers in the system. F, actively, actively engage with parents, teachers, communities, and all stakeholders. G, develop a robust assessment mechanism to evaluate collaborative work, project work, role plays, and quizzes. And lastly, track learning levels of all students. The reason I've laid this out is uh, to hopefully uh, make you realize the magnitude of what is required, the importance of having an efficient system uh, that hopefully can deliver against this, and to create capacities amongst all stakeholders, parents and students included, to be able to achieve this in an ambitious five years. Uh, let me complicate that by saying we're in a COVID year and we don't know how uncertain the next few years is going to look like. With that, I'll get started, Seema, <laughs> with the first question. Um, I want to you know, pose this, I, while I think it's very exciting for people like us in the sector, what I do want to ask you how this opportunity might be different from previous opportunities we've heard of, previous missions we've heard of, and do you feel that it'll just be another program which is probably going to be launched without much preparation? Your thoughts? Yeah. No, Amitabh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having me on the panel. Pleasure to be here um, You know, with the co-panelists that I have today. I think great topic. And you know, when you were speaking, um, when you talked about what FLN represents, what uh, Nipun Bharat represents, you know, what the goal is, the goal sounds fairly straightforward, right? When you then start creating a list behind it in terms of what it needs, one starts to get, <laughs> uh, you know, one's heart starts uh, racing a little bit about, the, you know, how will all of this happen? But I do think, I do think over the last, not just the last few months, but over the last year, since the NEP got, NEP got released, um, I think this is different. It's different because it's bold. You know, it's it's very bold. I don't think we've seen a as bold a target on learning outcomes on on how students are learning before stated and and you know taken up. I think it's simple. It's very simple to understand. You know, by grade three, every child has to learn X Y Z. You know, it's not complicated. Um, it's measurable. So it's it's not honestly very difficult to measure. 
um, it has captured everyone's mind space. I think it has not only captured the government's mind space and the government stakeholders across states, across districts, um, you know, whether it's uh, political leadership, bureaucratic leadership, but because of the primacy it was given in the NEP, but also everything which happened after that, including the prime minister's push, the education minister's push, the launch of the mission, it has definitely captured everyone's attention. And I think it's also one of those spaces where uh, the entire development sector outside of the government space has significant capability, significant interest and passion. You know, one of the few times when we, you know, we know that there are players out there who can do, you know, the literacy part of it, numeracy part of it, the assessments part of it. Um, there's enough funding behind it, you know, from philanthropy, from foundations, from multilaterals, bilaterals. Everyone's talking the same language. I don't think I've seen something like this happen before in India, at least in my sort of 10 years in education. So I think that makes it really exciting and different from the previous times. Um, Having said that, there are a few things that I worry about. You know, I worry right now about a very hurried checklist approach. Uh, you know, if you see some of the stuff which is coming to the states, especially from the center, you know, it's about, you know, filling up Excel sheets of, you know, have you ticked this? Have you ticked that activity, et cetera, right? And, and a checklist input approach vis-a-vis -a, -vis a true understanding of what is at stake here, what one needs to achieve and really sort of having the space to think about how that will actually happen. So I worry about a checklist approach. I do worry about too many cooks in the same pot. You know, um, we are working in four states. Uh, I can tell you that in each of those four states, there are at least 10 to 15 organizations knocking on the education ministers and the principal secretary's door saying, we want to work with you. And while I think that's great, at the end of the day, that creates complexity. Um, each organization has its own theory of change, has its own way of working. And you can't, you have to have uh, the right mix of people and organizations to make something come together, right? And I think we all need to find our own spaces and places rather than overcrowding in a few spaces. And I do think that, um, you know, on the margin, we also need to think about, I think we're forgetting the affordable private schools here. Um, in terms of how they think about FLN. I'm not sure anyone has a thought or a strategy around that, either the central government, state governments, or the you know external actors. And as we work in states, um, you know, there are in many states there are large populations which are marginalized, like tribal populations, who don't even, you know, and I don't think our systems and answers actually cater to that, right? So they cater to, for example, if you're working in Jharkhand. Um, the response is to the Hindi speaker or, you know, who will learn Hindi, but what is the response for FLN to someone who actually comes from a tribal background and doesn't even have Hindi as a native language? So I think there are some things which are getting lost on the margin. So that's where I stand, but I'm super excited. No, thank you, Seema. I think you said a few things which I know made Saurav cringe uh, when you spoke about simplicity and measurability. And I know Saurav is scratching his head every day. We work very closely with him in Madhya Pradesh um, in terms of the simplicity element of it. Uh, but yeah, we'll come to Saurav shortly. Asya, uh, Seema mentioned something very interesting, right? The whole checklist approach and too many cooks. I think that is a, a classic example in a country like India when there are too many cooks. They're likely to all want to be in the kitchen, right? Um, I, I'm keen to ask you specifically with the UK context and having been part of, uh, you know, Her Majesty's uh, uh, inspectorate as an Ofsted officer, having worked in, uh, you know, the Department of Education and having been a teacher yourself, um, you know, what, what would you say are key components of, successful change when when you're operating in mission mode what would you like to see that the indian government and states specifically do so um, i think what the, what, um, thank you i am um, wonderful to be on, on this panel um, with uh, uh, working on raising learning outcomes of, of children across the board um, the thing that comes to mind for me most is the national strategies in england and it resonates with the theme of saying about how many cooks are there so national strategies was a program across England, all primary schools, to improve um, literacy and numeracy. And it was delivered by one organization. And the components that I think really resonated with me was the clarity of the goal across the system. So very clear targets, very clear understanding that there was a floor target that all schools except for special schools needed to be 
met, how that translated, um, those targets translated into things that teachers can uh, address, which were like, by the end of the first grade, this is the learning objectives, these are the key learning objectives that should be met, this is the assessment system aligned behind it, and then all, the inspection system also aligned behind it. So we wouldn't go in to say, are you doing the national strategy? We would go in and say, are learning outcomes improving and what's causing that? So that was important. I think the other thing that was really important was support that was focused at the classroom level on improving teaching and learning. Learning is not going to improve if teaching is not going to improve. And having skilled professionals um, being um, rooted in what's effective pedagogy in those contexts and, and, and drive, um, driving that. The third aspect was the use of data and similar alluded to assessment as well. Is that use of data, but that data is informing action and assessment informed instruction at the classroom level, at the school level, and at the um, at the district and what we call local authority level. The fourth one is recognizing uh, it's like the data, the role of the seniors to take action, and they're being rooted in not just the data, but actually visiting schools, observing training, and asking the right question. So sometimes I think this is where the contrast is, is that if, if I as a, um, a, a district official am asked about the best schools, I'm not going to worry about the um, schools that are struggling or lower performing. But if I'm asked about who are my schools that have been most improved or who are my lowest performing schools and what action am I taking to, um, to shift that, that gets the focus on, on, on the, um, those who are left behind. Recognizing and celebrating success is really important. It will be teachers with shifting learning outcomes, it will be schools that are the stars. So celebrating them, sending a letter by seniors. I still have mine um, um, on the ones that have most improved. And I would reiterate that point about keeping it simple. So, um, even in the national strategies, there was almost too much happening over time. And then you're confused about what am I supposed to focus on? So really keeping it simple. Um, particularly in the early, uh, early stages about what needs to happen and how it's going to be supported to make happen. Asya, you've said uh, uh, some, you brought up some very interesting points that I'll come back to Seema on because uh, a lot of what you said about, you know, building um, assessment mechanisms at a classroom level, um, you know, ensuring the teacher observations are done in a proper manner. The capacities are built at all levels, visiting the schools that need you the most. Uh, I mean, these are, I think, just foundational elements that any good quality education system must have before you start thinking of building layers above the foundation. And I know Seema is doing a lot of work, but Seema, I'll come back to you to ask you your experience in the various states you work on and where are we as a system with regard to putting some of those you know, foundational elements in place. But let me come to Saurav before that and sort of specifically by, you know, coming to the FLN component and and, and you're talking about uh, now about a five year journey, right? Uh, if 2020, by 2026, uh, the government of India is expecting states to achieve these ambitious targets, which may seem very simple, uh, but are actually quite complex, uh, given the constraints of our system, right? Uh, just a statistic for those who are listening in, uh, about 40 to 50 percent, uh, this is a study that was done by Professor Geeta Kingdon, about 40 to 50 percent of our schools in this country, in the 1.5 million schools in, in our country, 50 percent have fewer than 50 children and therefore one or two teachers in them. And I'm talking about children, 50 children who are spread across five to eight grades, one or two teachers. Now think of trying to deliver a program around foundational literacy and numeracy when you don't have a dedicated teacher for more than maybe two hours in a week, right? So if these are the kind of constraints we're faced with, sort of what is it that you would expect states to put in place in the, let's say in the first two years, so that this ambitious target of everyone attaining foundational skills by grade three can be met? Well, um, and thank you everyone for uh having me in this panel. Um, so uh, to your point, uh, Amitam, I think, uh, I mean, I think uh, the way we are looking at it is, uh, I think there are four or five critical uh, pillars that every state would need to work on. And it's kind of 
explained beautifully in the Dokko Nippon document of having curricular reforms and administrative reforms. It uh, evidently boils down to that. But, but I think the first and foremost thing, of course, is this whole thing about goals and outcomes. And well, the document uh, ha and scheme has done a good job, as Seema mentioned, on having very simple goals at a lecture level. Uh, if you come down the document and go into the learning outcomes, there's a hoping 480 learning outcomes that's listed out there. And it's obviously tall order for anybody to kind of make sense of how those learning outcomes are related to each other, how are they related to the goals in the first place. So I think there would be some tasks required to kind of simplify the not only the goals, but also learning outcomes. Uh, in a manner that everybody can understand across the system. Uh, at the goal level, you might uh, want the parents to know that I, as a parent, I need to know what my child should be learning at the end of grade one or grade two or grade three. But at the teacher level, the learning outcomes should also be reasonably simple because you, you can't expect a teacher to remember 480 learning outcomes. So how, what, what are the key uh, outcomes that they should be working towards? So that that's one. A uh, set of activities that needs to be done around that, and and obviously the the development of those goals and outcomes, and then the communication of it. How do you communicate those across the system to make it, uh, you know, the same same communication going around? Um, the second major uh, bu bucket of things that you uh, might say is around the kind of reforms that we just talked about. Uh, whether there are teachers available to teach grades one and two dedicated whether the uh, whether you have enough teaching time available at the school because at the school level you will find i mean uh, you you might have a year of 25 weeks or 30 weeks or whatever it is from state to state a lot of that time is going on you know back to school campaigns or uh, there are uh, various things that happen at the school level so your effectively instruction time available for any teacher to kind of instruct is very limited. And, and then on top of that, you have a multi-grade situation. So your instruction is again divided between two, three grades. So effective time on task becomes very low. And how do you really design a program which, uh, which uh, helps you to attain all those goals uh, within a very limited instruction time? That becomes very, uh, I mean, the document again has very, uh, very logically meant a pitch for a balanced literacy approach, which is the way to go uh, internationally. That's what is being proposed. Uh, but you really have to kind of think through the uh, an explicit instruction design. Uh, some of the things, uh, the other thing that one would probably need to uh, work, not work a lot, because I think in terms of materials, there's a huge amount of materials and content that is available across states whether it's digital, whether it's physical, all kinds of contents are available. The only thing that you have to uh, really, uh, you know, uh, figure out is how this content can actually be curated in a manner that it supports the instruction process and it, it doesn't kind of work at cross purposes. So that that's again a big thing. And, and, and one of the things that's happened post COVID, as you know, I mean, there's a whole lot of digital content which has come in, which has created even a digital divide. So really, how, what is the correct kind of content that you want to get into the classroom, especially for these young children who are not so much exposed uh, to digital content. So, so that's a challenge, I think. Um, the, the fourth bracket, uh, uh, I would say, is around you know, capacity building across the system, uh, whether it starts from uh, you know, the education officials down to the teachers. And, and the ca capacity building probably has to be in two levels. One, one is basic mindset uh, changes. I mean, if, I mean, take it like it's almost uh, everybody knows that. At a school level, grade one and two is not a priority. If you have two teachers, they go to grade three, four, five. Uh, they, so even to bring that mindset change, that grade one and two is what you should focus on. It has to be a priority across the system because the BRC, when he goes and inspects the school, he is not bothered about one and two. He is asking about grade three because that's where the NAS is going to happen. So, I mean, I think the entire system orientation needs to change to focus on, on foundational grades. And therefore, and then, of course, uh, what are the, uh, what are the uh, you know, instruction or, or curricular or pedagogic, uh, you know, trainings that teachers would require to uh, 
uh, to kind of address this thing. Again, I mean, uh, one thing that one should uh, keep in mind is uh, like early grade literacy and numeracy foundation learning is one area where a huge amount of research has happened across the world in the last 10 years. And, and unfortunately, as a country, we have not really been uh, able to absorb all that research. I mean, I mean, we are talking about brain research now, neurosciences, which is uh, you know, there's a lot of research which says how uh, a child learns better. And we have not been able to uh, imbibe all of that. So, so the state should take this as an opportunity to bring in these best practices from across the country. Uh, and the fourth, the fifth one, uh, I think, is around involving parents and community, and that's again become very important post COVID, where you think, uh, where you see that schools are intermittently open, not closed. So a lot of learning is going to happen in the home, and even once schools are open, I guess uh, you have to kind of uh, have some amount of learning happening at home. And so, how do you really engage parents and community caregivers and community? to support uh, you know uh, a lot of uh, foundation learning activities at at the parent uh, house and community level is one area which needs to be thought through and finally i think the whole issue about monitoring and assessment uh, where you talk about you know formative assessments summative assessments how how those things will flow in and inform your your delivery uh, but also uh, in terms of assessment of teaching practices because ultimately what you are looking at uh, what you have to aim for is a change in teaching practices. Unless that happens, your the results are not going to be delivered. So to keep a quite close track on whether children's yeah. teaching practices are changing in the classroom is very yeah. important, I think. Um, these would be the broad parameters yeah. I would think of. No, Saurav, you touched upon many. And like I said, you know, COVID is going to complicate things even further. And I'll come back to you to get your very practical suggestions on what we need to do right in response to covid uh, i know you work with a number of states uh, as do the sema and many people sitting on this on this uh, in this uh, panel um, but, but you know what will be what will be the future uh, i mean do we need to redefine uh, what our goals are do we need to redefine our pedagogies you touched upon parents you said the role of parents and uh, both digital and non digital we saw uh, through a study recently in Azim Premji where the digital penetration across our country is very, very poor. And even if parents and mothers and fathers have smartphones, uh, the ability for a child or multiple children in that home to access that smartphone for learning is negligible, right? Yeah. So the digital infrastructure in this country just doesn't exist. So we can't uh, hang our hats on uh, digital being the answer. So I'll come back to you and just get your practical thoughts on what do we need to do to almost recalibrate the education system uh, to, and I don't call it post-COVID because post-COVID is many, many years away. It's during COVID. What is it going to look like during COVID, right? Which is what we're in the midst of. So Seema, let me come back to you about the whole system reform piece, right? And I think it's about, like we spoke about these foundational elements being put in place. You've worked with a number of states, continue to work uh, under the SATH E initiative uh, also for a number of years. Uh, and I just want to get a sense from you what your learnings have been uh, with regard to these recent system efforts. You know, what have you seen happen um, both within India and globally? Um, is it making a difference? Are we preparing ourselves better to be able to deliver high quality education or not? Yeah. Absolutely, Amitabh. Firstly, I just uh, you know want to acknowledge the list that Saurav laid out. I mean, I was going to talk about you know how one needs to take a systems lens when one wants to achieve a goal, and Asya also touched upon it a little bit about you know teacher capability and measurement systems and data systems are critical. Let just let me let me just stop you there for a second. I just want to tell all the audience members to please post their questions on the chat group. Uh, we may not have time at the end, but if you post them, then the speakers could take them as as in when they're speaking. Thank you. Sorry, Seema. Yeah. And, and the truth is that, you know, every state in India has a slightly different context um, in, you know, and some things are working and some things are not working. So if I was to take an example, you know, Rajasthan, uh, there's almost no teacher vacancy, a very limited teacher vacancy because of, you know, some of the stuff that has happened over the last five or six years. But at the same time, you know, they absorb their BRP cadres, uh, you know, which are the monitoring cadres and the mentoring cadres into the schools itself. So there is no... BRP CRC cadre uh, in Rajasthan, and how does one actually, you know, fix for that, right? Um, 
they in in jharkhand on the other hand you know we have a 55% teacher vacancy in primary schools i mean one you have so many sub scale schools which only are you know allotted to teachers on top of that you have a 55% teacher vacancy but they have a great you know brc crc cadre which is external to the system you know which actually measures learning outcomes very accurately um you know madhya pradesh obviously as you know has the challenge of 80 90000 schools and you know it's just a very very large system and you know and while i think you know we can list out the foundational challenges like in seven or eight points that sort of just said our learning over the last four years is that they, they take years years and years of you know and very strong political will to actually fix some of those you know if you fundamentally need to recruit that many more teachers right if you need to address the issue of sub skill schools if you need to incentivize teachers to look at primary grades and not look at you know look at grades 1 or 2 how is that going to happen um and i think that hence brings me to the point that um as we think about external support to the systems to the states you know we have to build these elements into our own work expecting that the state will be able to do it on their own is expecting way too much right one so how are we actually building on all of those elements data systems teacher vacancy brp crp cadres incentive systems all of that has to be built into into our work and in order to do that i think political ownership and very senior administrative ownership of the reforms is very critical and often times and i mean i think we as bcg are probably far more guilty of that you know we kind of often times stay away from political leadership right we like we don't go there but honestly what we are realizing is that unless we go there you know our reforms will only go a certain way right and we have to find a way to go there we have to have that conversation we have to find a common ground there otherwise you know these foundational elements are not going to change and we are just kind of you know i call it sort of fine tuning the system and you know the chassis is broken right like the foundation is broken and you know that if you think about the mindset of the teacher what that does to the mindset of the teacher like you've changed nothing in my life except now you've given me a new set of tlms and a new instructional pedagogy and a new set of goals to achieve for right like like how is this fair i think so so i think that's the those are the pieces and the final thing i want to say is that um our view on systems reform is that rather than a pilot and scale approach and while i completely understand the benefit of that and you know the i think in every system there's a window of opportunity to get things done and i think we must leverage that window of opportunity to make things kind of happen at scale and refine the you know like what you say like you know you kind of redesign the aircraft while it's in flight and because i think if you know when that right window of opportunity exists with the political leadership and the bureaucracy and everything is coming together i think you just have to go for scale as long as it's, you know it's broadly right you go for it and then you refine it year on year right you can refine almost everything that you do year on year we all know enough about fln tlms pedagogies to kind of put something broadly right out there and then refine it at least that's our view so i think those are the things that i would think about i think political leadership buy in um prefer a scale change versus a pilot change and and you know just recognizing that these foundational fixes are very hard and have to be built into our own programs cannot rely on the state being able to do them for solely on themselves Seema I think that's that's a great insight having done this for many years and experienced it I think it's good to know what one should expect or not and you brought up something very interesting about political ownership and Asia I I, I want to pick on you specifically with the UK context or the Kenyan context I know you've been involved in programs globally the one that comes to mind specifically or the two that come to mind specifically one is the education delivery unit that was set up in the tony blair government under michael baba which i know had great political ownership it had a mission mode of sorts because you know the prime minister or his office was reviewing performance on a on a regular basis almost on a weekly basis i know the kenyan government launched a an early grade uh, program uh, under with tosome recently and i know you were involved with that i just you know it, it, do these sort of common threads ring a bell at sort does this make sense to you uh, what would you really want to see in the indian context given your international experience 
So uh, I think Seema's point about political ownership and political leadership is really important. Um, Lewis Crouch recently reviewed um, three systems that had changed, Sobral, um, um, Mexico, as well as um, Kenya to Somi. And in Sobral, the, the municipality leader was, my children can read, I'm going to make sure all other children can read. Tony Blair came in with education, education, education. But then the system, the leaders who didn't just do hands off, they were at the end of a phone. So if a district of, you know, in, in, in the UK, we have local authorities, and if the CEO wasn't behind it, the local authority, Martha Barlow would pick up the phone and say, what's going on? Um, and then when, um, as sort of CRBs, or the equivalent of me being a CRB coach there, was I would be able to draw in um, Department of Education officials to come in and say, this local authority is not taking this training seriously or the schools are not on board and then take them to visit schools that weren't um, weren't sort of um, making progress and, and not just challenge them, but also offer support. And I think this bit is really important that you have to say, this is how we will help. And and Seema's point, uh, you know, having been a teacher for 12 years, you just can't keep laying on things. You've got to be also removing things and you've got to be also by their side and helping them. And and one uh, one sort of story from Tusome. I, I wasn't involved in 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 Kenya and Tusome, but I've been studying it. That really resonates with me. They did. They were convinced to do a pilot because learning outcomes were low. But the minister was so keen that the right things were acted on that when they started hearing that this pilot is really making a difference, he went to visit with his own reading book. He didn't want one that was part of. Um, the system, and then he took the reading book, sat with children, and read, and realized that they could actually read an independent reading book, and therefore then rolled out that program. But what, what you know, with these programs, how you develop the capacity of local leaders to take them, um, to national leaders to take on, on board and become part of this system is really important, because when the mission is realized, hopefully in five years' time, you'll want to be moving on to the next three years and the next six years of, of the academic calendar, not go back and do the same things again. In education, too little changes and we need to be making sure that more does change. And my final aspect here is we're doing a, a study RTI is leading and they looked at eight systems that did shift learning outcomes. Some of those systems, um, we, we have remarkably few examples that did shift. Some of those systems just shifted um, you know, 10 words per minute, so one from 10 to 20. Um, the Kenya was an outlier and two in India. One is room to read, so um, um, sorry, I can't tell you more about it. Two standard deviation um, improvements, like 40 words per minute increase. So there are examples in India to learn from. Um, and another one, of course, is Pratam, uh, the famous example. But Obsima's point about we broadly know what to do with literacy, having that framework in place and having schools and districts innovate within that. Numeracy, I would argue, we need to do a little bit more work on learning what works there. Thank you, Asya. Uh, I'm going to just ask Asya and Seema to quickly glance through the chat. There are some specific questions that have come your guys' way. And sort of while I ask you your next question, there's one very interesting question that has come about indigenous populations and home languages and the complexity of home language versus school language. And I know you have a point of view on this, but so two parts, if you can just absorb that into your response, I want to specifically ask you about COVID and the fact that the last 16 months have been largely lost due to COVID. We really don't have an Asar equivalent telling us what the learning level loss is. Uh, one can anticipate because we have done anecdotal studies and dipstick surveys, but it's going to be pretty terrible uh, once children come back to school, especially the younger ones. And my my question to you is, uh, we don't know how long this will last. So what does the, uh, what does the COVID world look like? Uh, we feel that parents, communities and technology will have to play a larger role. And I want your thoughts on how does one go about putting that in place? Like I said, recalibrating our stakeholders, shifting the focus away from a school building uh, to the multiple stakeholders involved in a child's learning. If you can just shed some light on that and also pick up on this question about uh, indigenous populations and 
multiple languages yeah so i'll probably go with the first uh, language thing because that's that's definitely a very critical component it's been highlighted by the national education policy it has been picked up by bharat and and there's always this challenge of you know at at one end pedagogically you know that it's always best to start with our child's home language but you also have the practical difficulty of a of a country which is so multilingual that a, a, like every classroom probably have three different home languages being spoken by the child and then what should be your language of instruction how do you really help the child to transition from the home language to the language of instruction those are challenges that exist i think at the first step uh, on this whole language uh, debate is that the first step that every state has to take every teacher has to take is to have a respect for the child's language i think if that movement is made i think that's a huge step taken forward currently what happens a large number of teachers uh, don't even appreciate the fact that the child can have a separate language and uh, and and there's a certain you know subtle language hierarchy that operates in the in the rural areas in in most uh, remote even even in many of the urban elite schools so i think if we can make that mindset change that every language is important and the child brings in a language as a resource and then work on that even that change is is hugely beneficial you do, you don't even have to talk about changing school language that can remain you can you know just to appreciate the fact the child brings in a language allow the child to speak in the language you can still speak teach in a different language but allow the child the the flexibility to really respond in in his or her own language i think that itself is a big uh, big uh, big step forward if we can take that as a priority and of course uh, i mean language issues are always political so i i think we need to get the politicians um, you know oriented rightly on this uh, so that's one and i can go on on the language issue so i think i i'll stop there but on the on the covid thing i think there are a couple of things that's happening one of course you as you mentioned there's a huge learning loss and let's let's face it and and i think the first thing is for governments to face it that is like huge and one can we are getting like the next cohort that's getting into grade three would get into grade three without any any practically any foundation literacy so i mean it's huge and so so i think one has to move from this tendency that most governments usually have is to do short term remedial program so to think that you have a short term three months course and children will be back to normal i think that's something that that's not going to happen let's be fair about it and the second thing that's and that's going to happen post covid or during covid is this whole thing about home as a learning space uh, is is uh, uh, is almost mandatory now because the schools are closed and child have to kind of run and learn at home but also when the child when the schools open and children come with this kind kind of learning losses it's unfair to expect that all that learning loss is going to be you know made up only through school instruction so there has to be a space for home based learning that will continue for uh, for quite some time and probably be part of the education delivery going forward so how do you strengthen that whether you strengthen the school community linkage or you work to volunteers or what is it i mean i think every state will have to find their own ways of how to deal with that but it's true that home is going to play a very critical role going forward and actually uh, it should be so i mean the parents are the first teachers i mean for foundation skills definitely all the whole i mean if you look at a, a you know listening speaking reading writing framework also a lot of the listening speaking uh, components do happen at uh, home and you can actually get parents to encourage all of those uh, so so that's very uh easily uh, parents can be uh, you know given sort of activities uh, that they can do with the children which promotes a lot of pre uh, pre literacy pre numeracy skills and which one should be uh, doing more of that uh, the third thing i think uh, which also covid has brought about the challenge is the challenge of digital divide as i said uh, the fact that there is a digital divide there's a lot of digital content going in and and has created this divide but also the flip side of it is that this digital this digital onslaught is going to stay i mean it's it's no wishing away that you cannot get back to a system where everything is fully physical 
because go for governments it's an easy way out i mean when you have a digital thing even if your trainings i mean for instead of doing phase two thousands of face to face trainings which cost so much of money online training is a much easier way out whether that has the same impact or not is always a question but i i think that going forward you cannot wish away digital things so you you really have to find the sweet spot where you judiciously use technology to supplement what is happening in the classroom so your your first charge would still be probably physical materials and physical content but how do you really sub supplement with with additional audio messages video messages how how can videos be helped in classroom transaction improving classroom transaction training those are things that we'll have to uh, think about the other thing that digital thing has done is, especially on the on the field of literacy, um, the whole thing about deep reading that has almost gone. I mean, that's gone even from adults. You know, I mean, for us as an adult, you probably never. Uh, I mean, the amount amount of digital information we are bombarded with, we never bother to really think through what we were reading. We just kind of forward things and glance through things so i think this is a skill that is almost getting lost so we'll have to really think uh, seriously on how to how to uh, you know focus more on deep reading uh, going forward and build those skills early on yeah saurav you've touched on some very important points and again you know um, theoretically speaking uh, make a lot of sense but practically to do it, uh, it just seems overwhelming. You know, when I look at a state like Seema mentioned Madhya Pradesh, which has more than a lakh schools, yeah. uh, you know, you're talking about such a complex environment and how do you do the monitoring of it? How do you do the capacity building of teachers? Uh, how do you, how does this actually come down to that classroom level? In this case, actually not even classroom, but at home. So very, very challenging. Seema, two questions that have just come from the audience. If uh, I can ask you to address the one around school rationalization and brand building for teachers what your thoughts on that are and then nuria's question around uh, you know the political will thing you mentioned political will doesn't come till i think it is pushed on them and is there a role of civil society to uh, somehow amplify the political will in a sense uh, so that they are forced to to support and act and lead on some of these crusades uh, your thoughts on both yeah. So I think, look, my views on school rationalization are fairly well known. Um, you know, strongly believe in that, not indiscriminate uh, school consolidation. But we've had examples of at least two states, Rajasthan and Jharkhand, who've done it successfully. Um, and and for the most part, you know, we saw 99% of the kids actually move to another school. And, you know, both of these states have actually shown very positive results in terms of learning outcomes, as well as um, increased movement from private schools to consolidated large scale, uh, you know, public schools. Um, so, um, and I think if done well, if done along with the community and thoughtfully, I think it can achieve a lot uh, in a country like India. And, and some of the foundational challenges that sort of, you know, data out about single teacher schools, two teacher schools, multi grade teaching, many of those can be addressed and just creating a positive learning environment. On, um, yeah, teacher brand and enablement. I mean, if you look at um, sort of one of the levers for government of Delhi, I think it was about you know giving respect and you know and 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 showing empathy for that last mile, right, for that frontline worker. And I, you know, um, funny anecdote, but. Uh, the, tw the board results went up quite dramatically, right? And this is CBSC board. This is not a state managed board in Delhi. So, so you can't sort of say that it was gamed. And we asked hundreds of teachers that why did board results go up? Did you get extra training? Or you, did you teach extra hours? And uniformly, everyone said, Jab hume itna respect mila hai, to hamara bhi man kiya padhane ka, right? So, if we have been respected so much by the state and we have been given so many facilities and our lives have been made easier then we also feel like coming in and doing our job. That's how all of us are in our professions, right? We work in environments which are enabling. So yeah, the, the more we can do on that one, uh, the better. Asya, over to you. Thank you. Asya, two questions that have come your way. One is about the reading fluency. Uh, is there a universal benchmark? Uh, I know for Akshara languages, it's slightly different as Saurav had, had stated. And the second one is about data. Uh, if you can just elaborate on how data might be beneficial specifically in the context of Nippon? Um, so, the, of course, we expect fluency because, and as your video clip showed, 
if you have forgotten the last few words of the sentence by the time you got to the sentence, you're going to be able to comprehend the sentence. Um, so many um, um, low middle income countries are setting an expectation or a target for um, fluency, but that shouldn't be our goal, that reading with meaning and comprehension and enjoyment and engagement for learning is the goal. England doesn't have a word per minute target. Um, it you know, expects children to read with frequent fluency. They, they have an assessment check on um, phonics check um, for six, seven year olds, but not a, um, a fluency target. And I think quite a few of us um, might be able to read another language because we can recognize the letters, but if we're not comprehending it, we're not getting to the point of reading. The, que the second question about data, um, having good quality, accurate, reliable data is a must for any program, but particularly so um, if we're going to be shifting learning outcomes. But importantly, having that data isn't sufficient. It's the use of that data to inform action and the use of that data um, by everyone in the system. So if I'm a teacher, I will quite often know that the, these are the children who are struggling. What do I do about it? If um, the, the programs are supporting schools and teachers, are they looking at the data to say these are the schools that are most troubling, we need to provide more support to them, and perhaps we need to do slightly differently because what we've been doing up till now hasn't worked. Sometimes what happens is that the best teachers, or the most effective teachers, are given to those who are performing well. We actually need the most effective teachers to the students who are struggling, so support them. I observed language and learning at LF um, um, school in Haryana. It was a joyful place to be in. I mean, it was, it was just one of the one best lessons I've seen, and I've seen loads and loads of lessons. Um, and the teacher was really enthused by that word per minute target, and he was driving her to say, "My, you know, the student should be able to do 100, and the target was only 45 or 60. But it wasn't just a target, it was the joy of being in the classroom. And then how the system uses it is also about, you know, are they focused on the right thing? Too often in, in, in education um, reform programs, we focus on have this um, textbooks been delivered, are the teachers attending, et cetera. All of those things could be in place and learning is not improving. So how do we get better quality data about the shifts in teaching and the impact they're having on learning? My final point on data is it's not just numerical, it's um, it's qualitative data and as um, Her Majesty's inspectors we would often say to schools as well as systems don't tell me about what adults are doing tell me about the difference it's making to children and if we have that as a focus and that's part of what's driving um, the data that would be important I have one final point on this yes. it's a micro level um, bit of the data so if we shift letters then how soon should we be shifting them and then we look at that we look at the training and the impact of that then we go to words and then we go to systems and some might argue that's breaking down um, the joy of reading too much if we keep the joy at the level but actually um think about how the actions are taking us to that point we're more likely to make progress great thank you we are almost out of time i think we may have 30 seconds left uh, i would have loved to carry on but i'm going to quickly try and summarize in 45 seconds um and 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 summarize more in the form of questions than answers because I think that's what we're faced with right now, um, and and sort of touched on these uh, briefly. But I read an article by his colleague Nidhi Vinayak and Amit Kapoor of Stanford, and I think they summarized it beautifully. So I'm going to try and capture it in these six questions. First and foremost is really, are we using the evidence that's out there when we uh, when we decide on our uh, literacy strategies, phonetic approach versus a whole language approach. What is the data saying? Question number two, um, the luxuries that we are faced with, uh, are we ready to redefine them uh, given the, the challenge of COVID and given that children haven't been to school now almost for two years? What do those new revised luxuries, what should they look like uh, so that they're realistic and measurable and simple? Third, uh, are we ready to do a curriculum overhaul? Because I don't think the status quo is good enough any longer. It's not going to work. If we retrofit, we will fail. Fourth, are we ready to prepare a new set of textbooks and teaching learning material and tools so that our stakeholders, most importantly, our teachers, 
uh, will be successful in delivering both literacy and numeracy programs. Fifth, uh, what combination of digital versus non-digital resources? India is still digitally weak in terms of infrastructure and its reach. Um, we can't rely on that. It works in cities and towns, but it doesn't work in villages and rural areas. What is the combination? And lastly, how will we go about planning for the capacity building of all stakeholders, now the community and parents included, so that we can build back better and hopefully deliver on our dreams of uh, a foundationally literate and numerate India? Let me thank the panelists. Seema, Asia, Saurav, thank you so much for joining. Uh, and again, uh, Charcha, Naj, Central Square Foundation. Uh, thank you so much for sponsoring and organizing the event. I want to do a quick plug for the next session, uh, which is titled Build Back Better um, School Education Post-COVID. I think we've left you with questions uh, in a COVID world, and I hope the next panelists and the next session answers some of these questions. So please stick around to join Sunali, Madhukar, and Ashok. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.